Welcome to week 21. Let's just get straight to it. We are in day one, Psalm 17, 35, 54 and 63. And last week I encouraged us to speak our own words to God rather than just other people's like David's. And I do stand by that advice. But I also will add that at times other people's hearts, their words can be really good starting points for our our own words, our own conversations. Meditating, thinking deeply about words such as, because I am righteous, I will see you. When I awake, I will see your face and be satisfied. These prayer songs of David's aren't examples of how other people should pray. They were entirely about him. He's often praying over specifics but he's also sharing how he feels about God and what he is experiencing in the moment with God. Oh God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you. And he wasn't writing something so that other people could use it to worship God. He's simply recording his own worship, but it becomes this incredible testimony of what worship looks and feels like so that we can use his experience to kind of springboard into our own record, maybe writing down our own psalm for today. My point is that my psalm wouldn't necessarily be useful to you in your worship. And that's something that stood out to me was relevance. These song words of David's are about now, they're about his present about him being hunted down and they aren't even relevant to other parts of his life and they certainly aren't relevant to most parts of our lives. When it says, lift up your spear and javelin against those who pursue me, let me hear you say I will give you victory, bring shame and disgrace on those who are trying to kill me, turn them back and humiliate those who want to harm me, it isn't necessarily going to be relevant to us. Although there are times in life where it will feel relevant, or at least symbolically, but it's not usual that you will literally have strangers attacking you and violent people trying to kill you. And while we often use what was literal for David as a helpful symbol for our thoughts and our temptations, or for, you know, for what feels like attack from a spiritual enemy, it wasn't what they were written for. It isn't their purpose. However, these song words would have felt very real to the people that David was leading and teaching. And I think if they were shared at the time, they would do several things. They'd let them see their leader's humanity, helping them to identify with him, but also see his faith as a kind of inspiration for them. For you have tested my thoughts and examined my heart in the night. You scrutinized me and found nothing wrong. I have seen you in your sanctuary and gazed upon your power and your glory. Your unfailing love is better than life itself. How I praise you, I will praise you as long as I live lifting up hands to you in prayer, etc, etc. So they're getting a front row seat in what a a good relationship with God looks like, but it would also help them put a framework around their own feelings, feelings of being, you know, on the run and not knowing what was going to happen next. When they hear things like, but God is my helper, the Lord keeps me alive. May the evil plans of my enemies be turned against them. Do as you promised and put an end to them. Rescue me from the wicked with your sword by the power of your hand. And these songs of David would build their faith. Lots of hope-filled declaration is in there, giving them a kind of positive outlet for their concerns. You know, when he says, I am praying to you because I know that you will answer, oh God, bend down and listen as I pray, show me your unfailing love in wonderful ways. In Psalm 63, we hit the first time that we see David refer to himself as a king. At least that's what it appears like when we first read. And he says, but the king will rejoice in God. All who swear to tell the truth will praise him while liars will be silenced. A couple of things made me stop and question. He's not done this before. He's not called himself king. So why start now when he isn't king yet? 
And also, who is it that he is saying should be praised? Is it that if we tell the truth that it's God that we're praising or the king that we're praising? And if it is the king, then that's not something that we've seen him refer to before. One explanation is that this psalm is out of place in its chronological timeline. And some do believe that it's been written about a later time when he is king and he is boasted of by his people. Another is that he's needing to rally his people at this point, remind them that he is anointed to be king and encourage them to kind of stay in allegiance to him. And yet another is that he has slipped into a prophecy of a king who is to be praised, a king who, if we believe in him, brings us into something called glory and into truth, which is silencing lies. And Jesus said in Luke 24, I told you that everything about me is written in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms it must be fulfilled. Now it's possible that it is messianic because the first part of the Psalm sees David deep in worship with God. And then that is often when we flow into prophecy, but it isn't completely clear. So we'll come back to David's timeline. And day two, we've got 1 Samuel 27 to 28, where David hides with the Philistines and Saul disturbs Samuel from the dead. And what stood out to me was David's decision. Why did he think that going to an enemy, one that he'd had victory over in the past, would be a safer place to live? It could only be that they made themselves allies, made themselves useful in the Philistines' war against Saul. It's a risky plan. It reminds me of the time that Abraham you know, solved the, the problem of the famine and they went to live in Egypt. And we see David doing this sort of similar problem solving, you know, but David kept thinking to himself, someday Saul is going to get me. The best thing I can do is to escape to the Philistines. There's no David inquired of the Lord here, so I wonder if it's going to turn out okay. As we see him again and again take crazy risks in this environment, he learns to lie extremely well. But it got me thinking whether this is God initiated or not, we can see how God is using it for further training. And David's army, they live both in an enemy city and in the countryside, and they would learn things about their enemies' ways of living and warring that they might not have known before. And what's crazy in it all is that the Philistines never find out that they are lying to them, that they're not killing off you know, the Israelites, they're off killing off others. And it would be logical that if a previous enemy came to live with you, you would at least check up on them at times and make sure. So it seems to me that God is doing more of that behind the scenes work that we saw him do before, possibly causing the king to just not see what is going on. Akish tells David, as far as I'm concerned, you're as perfect as an angel of God. But this is personal to, to him because later we'll see the Philistine commanders don't have the wool over their eyes. They're gonna say he can't go into battle with us. What if he turns against us in battle and becomes our adversary, which is a kind of wiser way of thinking. We know that God is with David at this point, but we do also know that he is not with Saul. And I think Saul is really missing that. He's desperate to try and hear what God wants him to do, to have God back on his side. And I've been thinking since last week's readings that the real Saul is still there. The Saul that God chose because he must have seen some good in him. And while it's all gone wrong for him, for all the reasons that we have explored, that tormenting spirit that he now lives with, it isn't always in control. Whenever he's in David's physical presence, there's a change in Saul. And this could be because when he's in David's presence, he's in God's presence because God is with David. So was it just David's heart, music, or even worship that caused the evil spirit to flee in the past? Or was it the presence of God in David? When we look at what happens whenever Saul is near David, or just hears his voice, we see regret and repentance. 
like Saul suddenly is able to see the truth again, saying things like, is that really you, my son, David? And then he begins to cry. And I have sinned. I've been a fool and very, very wrong. I realise that you surely are going to be the king and that the kingdom of Israel will flourish under your rule. And this hunt for communication from God is interesting. Is the tormenting spirit slumbering because David is seemingly not a threat anymore? So Saul has clarity and yearns for God's wisdom again? Or is he remembering what it was like when he had Samuel and he was able to hear what God was saying through Samuel? Or is he just that he knows that without God they are all going to lose? Um, he's going to die and he's just desperate for his life. As he says to Samuel, I'm in deep trouble. The Philistines are at war with me and God has left me and he won't reply by prophets or dreams. So I'm calling to you to tell me what do I do? So the death of Saul and his sons in battle is prophesied and in day three, first Samuel 29 to 30, we get this rare view from the enemy's perspective and we see David's skill in deceiving them, reaching new levels. <laughs> what have you ever found in your servant that I can't go and fight the enemies of my Lord the King? So it's a Friday afternoon and as I tackle day three's readings, it was a really stressful admin day because I'd made a mistake over something that means that I knew I was going to have to get up early on on a day that I shouldn't have to get up early and sort scaffolding and all sorts of things at church and I found it really difficult to focus and I think that's realistic when it comes to reading the Bible. The temptation is just to get it done and tick the box and move on and I could just have quickly listed the things that stood out to me like when David said to Abathar the priest bring me the ephod so Abathar brought it and David asked the Lord etc which brought me back to why didn't he do this process in the decision to go and live with the Philistines. Is the ephod style question only for battle? Or how God reinforces to David that he is the God of restoration and justice. David got back everything the Amalekites had taken and he rescues his two wives. Nothing is missing, small or great, son or daughter, nor anything else that had been taken. David brought everything back. And it's like a prophetic sign to him that even though all was taken from David, God can and he will restore it and more. Or when David insists that the plunder being shared equally, whether the people went to fight or they stayed back because they were exhausted, it reminded me of Jesus teaching new ways of thinking and his parable of the hired workers in Matthew 20, that the men who had worked longer complained, you know, these last men have worked only one hour and you have made them equal with us who have borne the burden of the whole day, you know, in the heat of the day. But he answers them and says, friend, I am not doing you anything wrong. You did not, did you not agree with me to work for one denarius? Take what's yours and go your way. I wish to give this last man the same as you. Or how David, like Jesus, is defining what his kingdom wants to look like. He's making his first law for Israel, even though he isn't actually king yet and I could have talked about all of these things but I felt just too distracted to develop any of those thought lines and it did feel like I was probably missing some gold in it all so I just simply prayed Holy Spirit you know don't let me miss anything that you need me to learn or anything Jesus wants to lead me into when I come back next week I just prayed for open eyes so what stood out when I did come back after the weekend? Well, I reread chapter 30 and I noticed two statements that almost stand in opposition to each other. One is David was now in great danger because all his men were very bitter about losing their sons and daughters and they began to talk of stoning him. And the other is David brought back everything and he also recovered all the flocks and herds and the men drove them ahead with the other livestock saying this plunder belongs to David. So on one side we've got his men wanting to kill him and on the other side we've got them 
boasting of him, their allegiance is renewed. And I wonder if there had been a bit of trouble in the ranks before this instance. You know, why would they turn on him so quickly? Did God use it to strengthen David's leadership? In between the threat and the subsidence of the threat, bearing in mind that David himself is grieving and probably blaming himself, it says, but David found strength in the Lord his God. All that God training and relationship building is paying off. And that got me thinking about how it's only in our future that we discover how much we've grown in faith because of the difficulties in our present. It's those encouraging words that people give us that do not feel encouraging when we are in the thick of it. It's the God is at work in you, in the difficulty, strengthening your faith speech. And you know it's true, but you're just so deep in the mud that it's hard to see its value. But later on though, if you give time in your life for a bit of reflection, you can see the trail of faith growing circumstances that have led to your being strong in the Lord now moment. And some of David's words are, reflected in tomorrow's Psalm 18. So we're going to start there. We're in day four. We've got Psalm 18 and 1 Samuel 31, which is the death of Saul and Jonathan. And as I read Psalm 18, a few statements made me question, why is it here chronologically in our timeline? At this stage, David is not officially king. He's living with the Philistines. He has around 600 men who he's in charge of. So why is he saying things like, you appointed me ruler over nations. People I don't even know now serve me. There are certainly statements in this psalm that fit with what David has just gone through with the capture and rescue of their families. Their camp is attacked while the men are away and they're vulnerable. It says they attacked me at a moment when I was in distress, but the Lord supported me. His men threatened to stone him, the grave wrapped its ropes around me, death laid its trap in my path. He asks the Lord if they should attack, but in my distress I cried out to the Lord, yes, I prayed to my God for, for help, and he heard me from his sanctuary. God confirmed to attack, and then they easily defeated them. The Lord thundered from heaven, he shot his arrows, he scattered his enemies, great bolts of lightning flashed and they were confused. And all this would reveal the strength that David has in the Lord. In your strength, I can crush an army. With my God, I can scale any wall. God arms me with strength and he makes my way perfect. He makes me as sure-footed as a deer, enabling me to stand on high, high mountain heights. A bit of research shows that this psalm parallels a song we haven't read yet in 2 Samuel 22, where he is singing from the perspective of the end of his life. But it is generally thought that this was written much earlier, and it's just this is the one that he chooses to do that reflecting. Which makes me wonder if some of the lines were maybe added to the psalm at that later time, causing me a bit of confusion in my time. But when I think about how I record my thoughts to God and about God, and then how often much later God will remind me of something that I wrote down, have me pull it up from an old notebook, write it out again as if it's current, and he will often add an update. This is why we often refer to God's communications as multi-layered, so they can have layers of meaning and layers of time application. And they often come out as we pour our heart onto paper. We slip from our own words into his words and back to our own words. So it's possible that that's what we're seeing with this psalm. It's written at the time when the Lord rescued him from all his enemies and from Saul. But it's pulled into this time when he's reflecting with God on his life. And where he can now say, you appointed me as ruler over the nations, people I don't even know now serve me. 
back in the present day, David is as yet unaware of the gruesome death of Saul and the death of his best friend, Jonathan. And Jonathan's death is a hard one. You find yourself wondering why would God let that happen? But of course, the bigger question is why do seemingly innocent people die? And we are reminded of the gift of free will, the choice to make decisions that we make and that other people make, that we're living in the consequences of the choices that were made 10, 20, 100, 1,000 years ago. That Jonathan, knowing that David would be king, knowing that would mean the death of Saul, chose to stay with his father Saul. He could have gone with David, but he didn't. And fighting with a losing king whom God has long since left is a risk and it doesn't pay off well for him here, sadly. So last day, we have day five, Psalm 121, 123 to 125. So in between David's victory over the Amalekites and his mourning over Jonathan and Saul, we're presented with this group of kind of short songs. And Saul was 30 years old when he became king. He reigned for 42 years. And it's now thought to be around 1010 BC when Saul dies. These psalms are part of a group of psalms which are called the Songs of Ascent or Degrees because they're thought to be about marking a journey towards worship. So either going to worship in Jerusalem or the Levites ascending the steps of the temple. And of course, that's not what they were written for because there is no temple, but they are about the author's journey and they are worship. So it's understandable that they would be collated and used for that. Some attribute all of the group as being written about the time that we are in. Others attribute some of them to much, much later um, when they return from exile in Babylon and another time when the walls of Jerusalem get rebuilt spoiler alert. Now the plan I am following has them in David's lifetime, possibly not all written by David. So we'll look in that, but we should bear in mind that some of these might be about later on. The language of these Psalms stood out to me. The Psalms we have read so far are really personal to David. They're, they're written almost as private prayers and requests and recognition of how he feels about God and what God has done. But these ones have a different tone to them and a different tense. Psalm 121 quite quickly shifts from I to you. My help comes from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. But he won't let you stumble. The one who watches over you will not slumber. Its tone is like a word of encouragement from one person to the other. Like when I look to God, I always find he helps me with X, Y, Z. So here's my testimony and I can encourage you. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He watches over your life. So whether this is David speaking as a leader or perhaps someone else speaking to him or someone else to encourage them, it isn't clear. Obviously, it is really encouraging for all of us who read it. And Psalm 123 has that similar start and flow to it, which makes me think it's the same author. I lift my eyes to you, O God. I lift my eyes to the mountains. And Psalm 124 is going to end with that same verse in 121. Our help is from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. But it's the leadership tone that is so evident in 124 and 125. What if the Lord had not been on our side? Let all Israel repeat. And just as the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people both now and forever. These leadership statements being made. And that brings me back to this either being David writing as a leader or being written by someone else at the same time or another time. And for that answer, I think we probably just need to read the rest of David's Psalms, which is handy because that is what we are going to do, to be blessed in all your reading and pondering. I'm glad that I'm not on this journey alone. Thank you for joining me and feel free to share your thoughts and your own journey in the comments. And I'll see you next time. The Chrome blog comes out each Thursday in 2022 and then lives in YouTube for eternity. If you want a reminder of new blogs each week, pop your email address on the website link below. And if you subscribe to the YouTube channel, it will be easier to find it in your subscription tab. See you soon.